All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's conservation event. My name is Joe Grabowski from Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, and I'll be your host for today. We're really looking forward to an exciting event today in partnership uh, with World Wildlife Fund and Earth Echo International. So it's time for animals to take uh, fate into their own paws. The Endangered is the first book in a thrilling new adventure series by world-renowned environmentalist and Emmy-nominated host of Exploration, Awesome Planet, Philippe Cousteau, and award-winning Turbo Racers author, Austin Ashlin. So, as I mentioned, we've teamed up with Earth Echo International and World Wildlife Fund to host a series of virtual events uh, throughout November. We're diving deeper into real-world conservation and learning more about some of the species first featured in the first uh, endangered book. So the polar bear, the orangutan, the narwhal, the pangolin, and the black footed ferret. We've had a great series of events so far. You can head to the, our YouTube channel, uh, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, and you can find some of those events. We've tackled the polar bear, uh, the pangolin, and the orangutan so far, and they were incredible events with amazing conservationists from around the world joining in with us. And then we have one more event coming up this week on the 19th, where we're going to meet Christy and talk about the black footed ferret. All right, let's get today's event rolling. I'm gonna bring in Philippe Cousteau now. He is the grandson of the legendary Jacques Cousteau. Philippe is a television host, author, speaker, and founder of Earth Echo International, an amazing youth organization, encouraging youth to get out uh, and play a role in protecting our planet. So Philippe, how are you doing today? I'm terrific, Joe, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good, it's great to see you. Great to see you, man, always so fun to do this. I've been looking forward to this one in particular. Uh, narwhals, unicorns of the sea, as they call them, um, truly one of the most extraordinary creatures, I think, on the planet. Um, and a key character in the endangered, let's see here, um, Murdoch is his name in the book. And um, he is the, uh, the, the troublemaking, wise talking, uh, uh, comic relief character of the series. And um, nevertheless, uh, also an endangered species. And and one that we really wanted to uh, to feature in the book, along with, of course, Nukilik, the polar bear, Arif, the orangutan, which we've already done events about, uh, and uh, Wangari, the pangolin, which we've also done an event about. So it's time for um, the the narwhal today. And my goodness, uh, what a what an incredible animal! You know, we chose the, the animals in the story to be representative of some of the main problems that endangered species are facing in the world. And so, in, in of course, in in um, in Murdoch's case, the Arctic sea ice is melting. The Arctic, the entire Arctic ecosystem where they live, is changing dramatically right before our very eyes. I know Terry, who we are so lucky to have with us today, is going to be talking about her experiences up there, and um, and it's really a, a cautionary uh, a tale. It's a warning to all of us that the, these ecosystems are changing, and and these incredible animals that are, you know, really indicators of the health of those ecosystems like polar bears um, are, are suffering. And they're an indicator, uh, of course, that the Arctic is changing. And the Arctic, remember, matters not just to narwhals and polar bears, but to human beings is the, the air conditioning unit of this planet. So along with Antarctica. So um, today is, is really going to be exciting. And, and, you know, this is part of this series that we really wanted to be able to bring the real life stories of these animals, because uh, the, the backstories of these animals in the book is, of course, based on and inspired by what's happening in the real world. Uh, just to remind everybody, The Endangered, it's a, it's a new book series, came out about a month ago, um, uh, and it's about a motley crew of endangered species that are rescued from the wild. As I said, a polar bear, an orangutan, a narwhal, uh, a, a pangolin, and two black-footed ferrets, and they are brought to a secret facility in the Galapagos, where they're administered a, a serum. And with that serum, serum they um, achieve these incredible hyper-intelligent powers. And so, again, you can see they're flying uh, uh, airplanes and we're in bandoliers and using electronics and they can uh, uh, scan satellites, et cetera, so, uh, and, and, and hack the internet. Um, so it's really an exciting story. It's an adventure about animals taking, uh, as this says, the fate into their own paws. Um, but the idea of the story is to tap into, oh, hello, we've got a little visitor here. Yeah. She found your bread. Oh, uh, we've got a little visitor to say hello, Vivian. This is why I wrote the book. I dedicated the book to this little one. And um, and really the story is about tapping into to young people's passion for for animals and for adventure, um, but also the, you know building on the opportunity to learn something. And so 
this webinar series that this is the, I guess the fourth one of, is a continuation of that commitment and a commitment to uh, providing resources and information, just having a little nibble before breakfast um, about, uh, about these animals. And also crucially, what you can do at home to help protect them. So uh, uh, again, thank you. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, we'll kick it over to, to Terry, Joe. All right. Well, Vivian, thanks so much for joining us today. That looks like a future conservationist oh, to me, if I've ever seen one. <laughs> all right. Hi, Vivian. Very cool. All right. Well, I'm going to tuck uh, Fleet backstage temporarily, and I'm going to bring in our speaker today. So Terry Williams is a comparative wildlife physiologist at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She's the director of the Center for Marine Mammal Research and Conservation there. For the past 30 years, her research has investigated the physiology of large mammalian predators. Specifically, she and her students are trying to understand how animals survive in a world that is constantly changing. So she studies animals globally, ranging from polar bears to lions, to penguins, to elephants, and much, much more. So let me bring Terry in here live with us. Hey, Terry, how are you doing today? I'm trying to figure out my hands. Hi, guys. <laughs> it's great to see you. All right. Well, it is great to see you. Before we we launch today, you you said something that that's really important. You said, uh, you know, you you love everything about your job, and it takes you to amazing places. And it's just like everything you hear about when you when you get to do kind of something out in the field. So we're really excited to get to know you a little bit better today and learn a little bit about some of your research. Absolutely. And I guess that's the main message for all of you guys listening is that, oh my gosh, this is the best job, absolute best job in the world. So um, I'll tell you about narwhals today, but there are lion stories and elephant stories and all kinds of animals we could talk about. But first a narwhal. And I'll tell you that I never thought they even existed. I, I got invited to go on an expedition to Greenland, so above the Arctic Circle, just below the, the North Pole, and I was gonna study narwhals. And I got invited because I had invented a little heart rate monitor. It was a little tube, it was sort of like um, what you have on, on your watch. You can monitor your heart rate, and I knew how to monitor heart rates of dolphins. And they said, well, let's, let's try and monitor the heart rate of, of a narwhal. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm willing to try and do that. I had no idea if it was gonna work, um, but that's how I got started in studying these animals. So first I wanna show you a couple of animals um, just so that you know what a narwhal looks like. You sort of have an idea but I'll tell you why they're so different and why they're so endangered. So this is, whoops, there, is a dolphin. And most of you know what a dolphin looks like. You know, it's got a fluke like this and you know it's got little pectoral fins like this. And most importantly, it has this dorsal fin on top. And over the years, we learned that this dorsal fin and these flukes are really, really important for the animals to lose heat. So when they're exercising and they're swimming and they have all this blubber and they're getting hotter and hotter, these little fins all get really hot and help them to lose excess heat. Just like you sweat, just like your hands get hot and your face will get hot when you're exercising, that's how a cetacean loses heat. So one of the big questions I had when we went to see narwhals, so here's a narwhal, and you can see two really different things about this narwhal. One is this amazing tusk, which is just a tooth. And in fact, here's something that you can tell friends um, about narwhals because most toys get it wrong. See this tooth? and see how they have the tooth right in the middle of like the forehead. No, that's not where it comes out in a unicorn. In a unicorn, the horn is on the top of the head and looks sticks straight out. For a narwhal, they always wanna put it in the front and it's the wrong spot. The tooth actually is like this tooth on the side of the face, it's always on the left side and it's over here, it's never in the middle. So ask your friends, where? what is this thing, this horn, 
and it's actually a tooth and it's this like pointy tooth you have your canine tooth coming out poking out of their upper lip but that's only one feature and that's the one that everybody pays attention to here's the other important thing look at its back no dorsal fin nothing and i started to wonder if that dorsal fin on a dolphin and a killer whale and all the other cetaceans out there, if that dorsal fin is really, really important for losing heat, what happens to a narwhal when it's swimming fast? You know, is it going to overheat with all the ocean warming that's going on? Are they all going to have a problem? And so we took another piece of instrumentation which was um, my iPhone, <laughs> looks like this. And on my iPhone, I can attach a little thermal instrument and actually get pictures of what the animal looks like, where the heat's coming up. So I'm gonna try and show you a picture. I'll see if it'll work here. Okay, so see in the middle of that picture, there is an orange and, and red stripe so this is a, a FLIR instrument, and it's a thermal image of the back of a narwhal. And what we discovered with just using my iPhone was that this ridge on the back here, that is sort of the thermal radiator for a narwhal. It's not big, but the water's cold, and so that's where they lose heat. Different than any other animal except one other Arctic whale. So think a little bit about all the pictures of Arctic whales that you've seen. There's one other Arctic whale that doesn't have a dorsal fin. And it's a beluga whale. So beluga whales and narwhals live in a place where there's ice all over the top of the water. If they're gonna come up to breathe, they might hit that with the dorsal fin. So they've evolved with no dorsal fin but they now have to take that strip of area and use that for losing heat. And that's really, really important because what we are finding when we're working up in the Arctic now is, yep, the oceans are getting warmer. We're finding more and more um, icebergs up there that the animals have to dodge and they do look like they're getting hot, that they're overheating and they overheat when they're being chased. And unfortunately, they're um, being chased by a lot of things. Naturally, um, or in nature, I should say, you know, killer whales are a problem for narwhals. And the other thing we discovered about them is, I don't know how fast Murdoch is, <laughs> but I can tell you of all the animals I've studied, all the swimmers I have studied, narwhals are really really slow oh my gosh they can't swim fast even if a, a, a killer whale is coming after them doesn't mean they don't generate a lot of heat because they're working really hard but they're the slowest slowest whale i've ever worked on and um, the way that they get away from their enemies is to sink out of sight and then they go into areas that the other animals can't go into so for if they're being chased by a killer whale, they'll go underneath the ice because the killer whale can't follow them because of that big dorsal fin. And they'll sneak out underneath doing, doing that. Um, the other sort of tough animal for a narwhal, so I'm really glad to hear that Murdoch is friends with the polar bear, is actually the polar bear. A lot of times when um, we're working with the narwhals, uh, we'll see these big like rake marks, big scratches along both sides of their body. And what we think is happening is a narwhal swimming along, you know, by the edge of the ice and a polar bear will see it pounce on its back. And then the narwhal gets away. And when it gets away, it scrapes along the sides and they end up with these white marks, scar marks. But at least it got away. So polar bears and killer whales are tough when it comes to uh, a narwhal's life. Then, then finally, the really big, big threat for narwhals 
you know, basically it's us. You know, what, what's happening up there after working for over 10 years in the same spot in Greenland, we're seeing fewer and fewer narwhals coming into the fjord system. We're seeing um, more icebergs crashing. It's a very noisy, noisy place to live. And um, it's, yeah, it, it, it's really hard sometimes when you go back each year and you see, you know, fewer animals. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that they're finding secret places way up in the Arctic where humans can't uh, impact them. And by that, I mean too many ships coming in now that the uh, ice is disappearing. More and more humans are coming into the areas, um, icebergs, and uh, you know, just big crashing ice in the area is tough to navigate for a narwhal. They can get trapped sometimes. Um, there's some hunting that's going on. I wonder if that's going to continue because the narwhals just can't handle that kind of thing. But you know, over over the centuries, what I've found, and actually across millennia, animals are really good at being sort of sneaky and finding places that humans can't get into. And I just have a feeling that there are probably places that we are unable to get to right now because of the ice. And I'm hoping that's where our narwhals are. So I think I might leave it at, at that and then we can um, answer or I'll answer any kinds of questions you might have um, and do, do it that way. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to bring uh, you back and I'm going to start right away. There's a question that came in via YouTube from a third grader in North Hollywood. Uh, and they want to know, you know, you were talking about how you're seeing less and less. What's what's our best estimate of, of the population? Well, in you know, they're in the tens of thousands up mm -hmm. in Canada. So the place that they're doing really well is, you know, Baffin Bay and Pond Inlet. So if you, you guys take a look at a map, and look at the top of North America, all along that, that upper ridge, uh, narwhals are, are there. The population that's having a really tough time is on the eastern side of Greenland. And there, you know, we're, we're literally, I think, starting to talk in a couple hundred. That's, that's what we're down to. And here's the sort of crazy, sad thing. This year, I couldn't go on expedition. Normally, we're there in uh, our summertime, so it's you know June, July, August, September, and we couldn't. I couldn't go this year because of the COVID restrictions. My teammates, who are from Denmark, did were able to go, and um, they didn't see one narwhal this year. Uh, yeah, I'm oh, a no. little bit nervous. We're going to go up um, this coming summer, and I, I'm hoping. It was just an odd year, but yeah, it's it's a very endangered population over there. Yeah, the, the doing, you, know, you see pictures sometimes of uh, you know sharks brought up alongside ships and uh, boats and and radio trackers put on and things like that. I know you talked about the thermal images. Is there mm -hmm. other work you do uh, with the narwhals? Do you ever fit them with something like um, uh, a tracker or you know something that can kind of follow their depth and habits and things like that? Absolutely. So this was the invention I, I told you all about as far as um, why I was asked to be part of the expedition. So I had this little heart rate monitor. It looks like just a, a little tube. It's about this big. And we take suction cups, put it on the bottom of that tube. And then uh, the narwhals are actually animals that have been beached. The hunters have come into uh, an area that's near our camp. They have um, nets that are out there because they are catching everything from fish to seals to, to narwhals. And um, we actually release some of the animals. It's an agreement with the hunters. We release some of the uh, narwhals. And um, right before we release them, they get a satellite tag so we can see where they're swimming through all the fjords and where they're going. And then they get my heart rate monitor with the suction cups. It stays on for about four days. And it is amazing 
Yeah, well, I the first time I got the record back. So the way we get the instrument back is the suction cups pop off, has a tag on it, and then we have to go out in a boat and find this tag floating in the middle of these icebergs. But we get the tags back, and it tells me each heartbeat of a narwhal. So I want you guys to to think about this. Your heartbeat's about oh maybe 70, 80 beats per minute while you're sitting there. So a little bit more than one a second. A narwhal, when it's on the water surface, so it's just sitting there and it's breathing, its heart rate will be about 60 beats per minute. So not that different from you. On a normal dive, a heart rate for a narwhal will go down to 30 beats per minute. So they cut it in half. So now it's really, really low. But if there is a ship in the area, if and there have been seismic ships there where they're exploring for oil, they've come in when we've been studying the animals, they had the heart rate monitors on, and their heart rates went down, I've never seen this before, to three beats a minute. And that that's like, it, it amazed me the first time I saw it. So think about it. If the narwhal's heart went beat, I'd have to wait for 20 seconds. So we'd be sitting here waiting, waiting, waiting. That's about five seconds before the next beat. It was crazy. And it's one of the parts of the biology of the narwhal that I think makes them really, really vulnerable. Because imagine, how do you move blood? How does you know oxygen get around the body if your heart is beating only three times a minute? Now that's a long pause between each beat. So that's one of the key instruments we put out. People haven't um, done that before. And another really cool thing is it has a little accelerometer on it. So you know how you can do step counts if you're exercising? We count how many strokes the narwhals are taking. So I can tell how fast and how slow they're swimming what happens when a ship is in there and they're trying to escape from them or from killer whales. It's pretty cool. Here's one more thing. One of the tags we had on had um, a microphone on it, a hydrophone. And so we could listen to what the narwhals were doing. And it's the first time anyone ever realized what kind of families they had. And we've actually got some recordings of a mom talking to her calf. It's so cool. So yeah, or talking to each other. Like if a narwhal is in a net, um, its buddies will be talking to it and they'll talk back and forth and then they can get back together once we release the, the narwhal. So it's pretty cool. So fun. Okay. Very cool. Let's dive into some questions because uh, we have tons of groups tuning in via YouTube uh, and they're just shooting questions our way. I'm gonna give a few shout outs, New York, uh, Belleville, let's see, Virginia, St. Catharines, Newfoundland. Uh, Newfoundland, got, you've seen narwhals. Yeah, we've got <laughs> groups tuning in in India, uh, more groups in Ontario, let's see, Niagara, North Carolina, so lots of great groups. Keep those questions coming. We're gonna to get to as many as we can. And we have a bunch of live classrooms with us. So I'm gonna bring in some of our live classrooms now. Uh, so we're going to go to Ms. Vanek's group in British Columbia. Let me bring them in live here. Awesome. How are we doing, British Columbia? We're doing great. All right. All right. <laughs> Big voice, honey. I have a question. What is the, like, the big long tooth thing? <laughs> so this long, long thing is actually a tooth. So if you open a narwhal's mouth, there are no teeth. You don't see anything, except if you're a boy narwhal, you get a great big tooth. It, it starts, as I said, up on the upper left side, and it just goes right through the upper lip. When I saw that, that was the craziest thing about a narwhal. This one tooth that it has, Sticking, sticking out of its lip, and it's not very pretty. I mean, it's actually a little strange having this hole in your your upper lip. But think about piercing your ear. That's what's happening, and it is a tooth. It has. Um, we opened one up, and it has 
the same insides that dentin that, that you have inside of your tooth. It's just that while your dentin might be a half an inch, this is like nine feet long of, of tooth. But one important thing about that tooth, only the boys have the really long, long tooth. Rarely you might see a short one in a female. And then um, normally the tooth stays inside the, uh, all the females. So when you see those big tusks, those are boys. When you see a short one, maybe a foot and a half, that's a girl. And then the coolest thing I ever saw, a baby narwhal tooth. Oh my gosh, it was only that long and it was so smooth and white. It was so cool. So it's a tooth. All right, very good. Henry and Mrs. Sears from Group joining us from Ontario. How are you doing, great two threes? How are you doing? Good, good thank you. Hi, guys. We have a lot of great questions. All I'm right. Not scared. <laughs> Why don't you ask yeah. What are their friends? Come here in front of the TV. What are they friends? Are they friends? No, what are their, say it again. What are their friends? Oh, what are their friends? Hmm. Well, mostly narwhals just hang out with each other. So their friends are other narwhals. There aren't a lot of whales um, up there for them to interact with. So there's beluga whales around, but I, we don't see them travel too much. But that would be their closest friend. If they were going to have a different kind of friend, it'd be a beluga whale. Um, they eat the fish, so that's probably not like their friend. At least the fish don't think so. Um, so let's just say that. Best friend would be a beluga whale. All right. Good question. Uh, let's see. Oakville, they would like to know about the lifespan uh, of a narwhal on average. What's their lifespan? Ooh. Um, 30, 40 years, and then once you get past 40, we actually had a narwhal. The way that we age them is almost by the length of the tusk. So when we're working on them, um, we had an animal that we measured the tusk, and they were thinking that he had grown to 80 to 100 years. Couldn't prove it, but um, that's sort of a really, really old narwhal would be 80 and average would be about 40 years. So a little bit younger than us. All right. What a miss it. You're joining us uh, from Ontario. How are we doing grade four fives? Hi guys. Hi. Hi. Um, would sea lions be a threat? Sea lions, did you say? Yeah. Um, no sea lions up there with narwhals because it is just too bloody cold for them. Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll come back your way shortly. I'm gonna go back to YouTube here because there's lots of questions coming in via YouTube here. Um, oh, here's an interesting one. Someone is wondering here uh, if uh, over time, maybe with age, do they lose that tooth? Nope. Um, the tooth continues to grow. And the, the sort of interesting thing about it is that it spirals around. So the tooth is, is really sort of rough and spiraled and goes all the way to the tip. And the tip will become really um, shiny because they've rubbed it on things or something. So this is like almost like polished ivory. And then the rest looks like a you know sort of ridged tooth. We've seen broken teeth. So every once in a while, a narwhal come up and the end of the um, tusk is, you know, is basically broken. But I've not seen a situation where there's a male and um, a tooth has fallen out. And the interesting thing about these teeth, you know how we have a little tiny root that goes into our um, jaw and keeps the tooth there. In the narwhal, it can be about half the, the length of their skull. So they've got several feet of a tooth that's still inside the skull. So it's it's in there pretty much permanently. All right. Uh, one more question from a fifth grader. Um, there it is. Anna wants to know, 
Um, are they limited? So how fast do they reproduce? Is that is that a reason why uh, they're in a bit of trouble? Is it slow? It's a little bit slower. You know, we're talking over a year for uh, for gestation. So for um, a, a calf to develop it. But, you know, there are another large uh, whales that um, are under the same, you know, the same kind of problem. A little bit longer, but not, you know, elephants are, are longer than, uh, than a, a narwhal or cetacean. Um, so no, I, I don't think that that's the, the big problem. I think the problem is, is really these external threats. And, you know, remember, you're living in an ice environment. Theoretically, the roof over your head is solid ice, and they have to find a place to breathe. If they can't find a place in 20 minutes, they, there's the potential that they're, they're going to uh, drown. And with all of this global warming, all of this change in the, the ice in the Arctic, imagine when the wind comes up, you've blown the ice over. You can cover up breathing holes. And I think that's probably one of the biggest threats. They need to know where those holes are. It used to be that um, they were predictable, and now they're not so predictable. So it's it's a pretty scary situation. Okay. okay. We're going to bring in uh, uh, sixth graders. Okay, sixth graders. <laughs> What is the population of narwhals? Uh, depends on where where you're looking. So Canada is lucky, and they have tens of thousands of uh, narwhals. But as I said, in Greenland, um, there's the West Coast uh, narwhals, and they can go up and visit the Canadian narwhals. So they're sort of a big group. But it's the Eastern Greenland narwhals that tend to be on their own and they're numbering in the hundreds and now we're concerned that maybe it's even lower than that so that's a that's a tough population when animals get below 200 individuals in a population we know that they're in trouble okay uh, British Columbia, Mrs. Matthew is joining us today. How are we doing? Hello, we're doing well. <laughs> um, uh, we know they swim slow, but but how slow do they swim? How many miles an hour? Yeah, how many miles an hour do they swim? Kilometers. Oh my gosh, somebody's going to have to do the conversion for me. I know it in meters per second. So, all right, Mark's, or not Mark's bits. Come on, who's the big swimmer? Phelps, Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps can swim at four meters per second. That's the best a human can do. A narwhal's gonna swim at less than one. So that's slow. It's slower than a human swimming. If, if you went into a pool, you would swim at a meter a second. That's a normal human swimming. So there's your range. You got Michael Phelps, Olympic swimming sprinter. He can do four. A normal human like you might do one. And a narwhal is even slower than that. You want to know a slower swimmer? The worst swimmer in the world for a marine mammal? Manatees. Oh, my gosh. They just they just float. All right. Um, so is that, I guess it's just, you know, dolphins. Uh, obviously are really fast swimmers. Uh, is it just body plan? Just something about their body? It's just not, doesn't give them that. You know, the, the, the truth is the, the body plan, you know, they're, they're both streamlined. So it's, it's not so much bad streamlining. I wonder if the tooth um, is part of the, the issue here, but, but even that's not, not as big of a, a problem. I think part of it is we, actually took muscle samples from carcasses. So what that means is I took a muscle sample from um, dead dolphins that had stranded on a beach, a dead narwhal, um, gosh, sea lions, you know, all these, these animals. And I looked at what kinds of muscle fibers they had. And I looked at a cheetah. So on one end is the cheetah, fastest mammal out there. 
and its muscles are filled with fast twitch fibers. 90% of the muscle is fast twitch, really, really fast muscles. All the way on the other end is the narwhal, 90% slow twitch fibers. And that's why I said, even if they wanted to swim fast, they, they can't, the muscles are just slow. Now humans like 50-50, we have half fast and half slow. And then Usain Bolt, you know, he's probably 100% fast twitch, but I never took a muscle sample from him. <laughs> but that's, that's the range. Cheetah on this, whoops. <laughs> Cheetah on one end and then um, narwhal all the way on the other end in terms of how they're built. All right. All right. Classrooms. Wave in your classroom if you have another question you'd like uh, to hop up and ask, and then I'll bring your class in. Okay, Mrs. Searson's class is waving like crazy. There they are. <laughs> All right, come on down. Why does the narrow have spots? You know, that's a great question. And presumably it's to, um, to avoid predators or to have, you know, basically look invisible to predators. So if you've got, they have sort of a whitish belly. So if you're a predator coming from underneath and it's looking up, it's going to see white and it's going to see white ice and it's going to be hard for a predator to see them. If you're a polar bear and you're coming from the top, you're looking at sort of speckled um, water up there. And so that kind of speckling will give them that you know, spotted appearance and be hard to see from the top. So I think that's the reason for the color. But I'll tell you, I, I like to do art. And the narwhal is one of the hardest animals I have ever tried to paint because um, the spots are so amazing. They're just, it, it's like it swirls and moves. It's a cool pattern. Never saw it in another animal. But I think it's just for predator protection. Joe, you're you're muted. <laughs> there we go. Mr. Hancock's class is joining us via YouTube, and they say they've heard nicknames like the Royal Unicorn. They're wondering if you've heard any really cool nicknames for uh, narwhal. <laughs> a nickname for a narwhal. You know, we name them after like Nordic names and Swedish names <laughs> and such. I think the coolest name I've heard so far is Murdoch. <laughs> I mean, that's an awesome name for a narwhal. Um, you know, the the name narwhal, it's it's sort of when you hear narwhal, obviously the last part is whale, but um it means corpse whale or dead whale. And um so that's that's sort of the the nickname for them. Uh and the reason they were named that they say is because they thought that this beautiful patterning that we think is gorgeous made them look like a dead whale when they were on the water surface. It, it's whiter than you see for most um, for most whales, except a beluga whale. Um, and they can sit on the water surface. And so, um, and cause they don't have a dorsal fin, it looked like a log. So they called them basically dead whales. That's what their name means. So that's their real nickname. I think they're prettier than that. All right. Well, I think I much prefer Royal Unicorn to dead. Yeah, Royal, <laughs> Royal Unicorn is cool. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ms. Vanek's class, I see somebody came back up to the camera for us. How do they eat? Oh, this stuff. Isn't that a cool question? Yeah. So we have the same question. I mean, look at that tooth. And then the mouth is down there. It, it seems impossible. Um, they tend to eat squid. So what happens is, you know, it could just get sucked into their mouth there. They, like I said, they don't have teeth on the inside to chew. So basically they're opening their mouth and just sucking what they can. I'll tell you that when we see them, they, a lot of the food that they're eating are these Arctic cod. And those are, you know, those are sizable fish you know, a little bit bigger than salmon. And again, the only thing they can do is, is have it go, you know, sort of straight into the mouth. So that we know that they do a buzzing kind of sound and then they're capturing fish. People have proposed something else though, and I'm not sure yet, 
So there are people that have said that narwhals will take this long tooth and they'll like sort of smash it back and forth into a school of fish and stun a fish and then the fish will just float into their mouth. Maybe, but um, the reason I sort of wonder about that, if only the boy narwhals, if only the males have the long tusk, then it still means how do, um, you know, how do the females eat if you don't have that tusk? So basically they, they open their mouth and they, they swallow them. You're still muted. <laughs> okay, we're on it. Uh, <laughs> I see someone front and center, go ahead. Have you seen a two um, born narwhal? Whoa, yeah, I've seen lots of skulls. <laughs> And I've seen you know, the double tusks um, in the museums in Copenhagen. The only one I've seen in the wild was um, an animal that had a full tusk on one side and then just the beginnings of a tusk coming out on the, the other side. So it's like those two canine teeth um, were sort of coming to, together. But it hadn't, you know, it hadn't crossed over. So no, not out in the wild. Um, but here's a question for you guys. So I told you that we saw a one-year-old baby narwhal, and it's still going to be nursing from its mom, just like dogs, you know, and puppies are nursing on their moms. So how would a baby narwhal with a tusk nurse on its mom? Wouldn't the tusk get in the way? It's like it, I ate we couldn't figure it out for the longest time. And what we think happens is that on a narwhal, if you look at narwhal milk, it's really, really thick. It's, it's almost like a toothpaste kind of, rather than regular cow's milk. And that, um, you know, they have teats just like, you know, dolphins and everything else. And we think that that sort of gets extruded. And then the youngster with the tusk you know, can just sort of suck that up and then instead of poking its mom with its little baby tusk. <laughs> Tell that to your mom. I'm going to bring in Miss Matthews' class one more time. I see someone in the school, NASA. <laughs> yeah, NASA. <laughs> Go ahead. What? Do narwhals hibernate? Nope. When, uh, I mean, that's a good question. That's what polar bears are going to do. But um, for narwhals, they're just like all the other whales and cetaceans. They are born ready to swim and dive, and they keep on going until the last breath that they take. So they are moving constantly. No hibernation. The only thing that they do, though, is they migrate. So they're moving up into northern regions and then down south. Uh, our field site, the reason we go the time that we do is that it's co completely covered in ice for the winter. The narwhals can't get in. But the moment that the ice breaks out in the middle of summer, they move into our area and eat all the fish that have been um, trapped there for the winter. So they move back and forth in winter to very specific areas, but um, they don't, don't hibernate. Always moving back. So I'm going to grab, I think this is a really good wrap up question. This has come up quite a few times on YouTube uh, and uh, students are wondering, you know, most of us live quite far from the Arctic. What are some things we can do in our communities, in our schools and such to, to help, to, to help make a difference? You know, I'll tell you, one of the biggest things that you can do is to get the word out. And, and by that, I mean, um, I think people need to know that you guys, your generation, loves these animals. And, and that may sound pretty surprising, but imagine if you're a politician and you're trying to determine if you're gonna sell oceanic permits for ocean oil exploration up in the Arctic. And they're gonna say, what a great place to, to do this. There could be lots of oil there and we'll do this. They don't know anything about narwhals. 
they don't know anything about the animals. And most importantly, they don't think anybody cares. Nobody is there saying, I love having these animals. I love the fact that even though I live in California, I want to see that there's going to be narwhals left in, in the world. So, I mean, I would be writing politicians. I would be making posters. I write papers all the time. But it's people saying that we want to see some places in this world um, kept safe. And we, we want to see these kinds of animals live live their full lives. And, and I know it doesn't sound like much, but it's true. Nobody, in, like in the U.S., in the um, Washington, D.C., they don't know that people care about these animals. So I would be figuring out with my classrooms how to get as many letters and information or whatever it takes, social media, to say, I want to see these animals live. And uh, I think that would make a big difference. All right. Cool. That's something that I think you can definitely do, right? Tell somebody. Tell somebody what they learn, and hopefully they'll tell more people uh, as well. So a few shout outs here as we, we get close to wrapping up. If you head over to exploringbytheseat.com, you can find our next event coming up uh, with the Black-Footed Ferret uh, on Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern. So we hope to see more classrooms uh, tuning in uh, for that event as well. You can visit theendangereds.com. You can find more information about Philippe's new book, uh, as well as some cool links and then opportunities to uh, buy adoption kits to help uh, make a difference uh, in conservation. And one more link I want to share today is earthecho.org. Check out Philippe's uh, organization. Um, all kinds of things you can find there from media to things other classrooms are doing, future events, and things like that. I want to give a huge shout out to all the classrooms who joined us live uh, via YouTube today. So many great questions, uh, lots of thinking about narwhals. Um, and then all of our camera classrooms, thank you so much. I'm going to pop you in just for a second. If you want to give a big goodbye and thank you, a big shout out. <laughs> So great to see everybody. And Terry, thank you so much for taking us into your world. I think we're going to have to take you up on that offer to get some lion stories and other stories about uh, some of the things you've done in the future. But thank you for taking us into the world of the narwhal today. Um, so much great information. All right. Well, thank you guys and thank all the classrooms. It was fun. All right. Have a great uh, rest of the week, everybody. We'll see you on Friday. Okay. Bye.